Dodi, we start today's episode in Barcelona, Spain. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yep. The year is 2017. And the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, the EMCDDA, as we usually just, say, EMCDDA, anyway, <laughs> um, they've just finished their annual report and they have found that the Catalan city was Europe's capital of cocaine consumption. Okay, that's not a normal topic for Discovery Matters. Is this what matters today? Sort of, yes, but not really. It's kind of exactly how the city's predilection for illicit drugs was really discovered. Okay, how is that? Sewage. They looked at the city's wastewater, they measured drug residue, and this form of wastewater monitoring and analysis that monitors in real time the way a city and its inhabitants live through the water they consume and the water they flush is also known as wastewater-based epidemiology. Again with the poop! Yeah, and not just poop, it's we as well and everything we yeah. flush down the toilet. So wastewater monitoring is what matters on today's episode of Discovery Matters. So bye-bye, Barna, for now. Let's head over to Canada for a more recent case of studying wastewater. We've been analyzing the wastewater in the province of Quebec for the presence of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the agent of COVID-19. This is Dominic Frigon, a professor at the McGill University and a specialist of biological wastewater resource recovery. With the change in concentration, we actually can tell the change in, in circulation of the virus in the population. And, you know, do we have a, an increase in, in case numbers? So I can, we cannot say per se the number of cases that we have, but we can actually find the trends of, of the, uh, the pandemic in a given population. In fact, he and his team instigated the level of alert to decide on lockdowns or different behaviours and to adapt the level of restrictions during the COVID pandemic. You can certainly use what you see in the wastewater to, to inform the decision making on the, the level of alert that you'd, you'd have for the next week or the next few weeks. You can actually start planning for, for your human resources. Well, that's pretty useful. How specifically did that work? Well, because of Dominic's work, public health authorities in Quebec could use the wastewater results to know how many testers they would need the following week so that they would not be behind the curve in terms of their reaction to the virus. That's when you have a, a entire city signal, you know, and then and then if you change the, the resolution of your sampling, you can go all the way to the other end. Uh, this is where we, we understand it and, and get the better responsiveness, but you can go to the building level and a, and a building level when the rapid tests uh, were deployed, but we didn't necessarily have a very large supply of rapid tests. We could actually deploy rapid testing in conjunction with uh, uh, building-based sampling of the wastewater. Such an excellent use of data. So what he's saying here is that if he couldn't get enough rapid tests to test the whole population, he could basically batch things, test the, bo test the exactly. population. Batch that is super smart. Where you need to, yeah. But then what about privacy and legal concerns? Well, so technically... Dominic says when it comes to wastewater, you're talking about sewage, right? So uh -huh. you put your rubbish out, it doesn't belong to you anymore. So legally, he and his team weren't really worried, but just because it's legal doesn't necessarily make it ethical. If you have, for example, a neighborhood that is mainly a group of a certain, certain ethnicity, then maybe it's not, maybe it's a large group, maybe it's, a, it's an entire neighborhood, but maybe uh, you run into problems of, of uh, stigmatization. So it's not necessarily, a, not necessarily to be seen on an individual basis, but in a lot of the, the isolated communities, so, so in northern Quebec where you have indigenous uh, uh, reserves, information goes very fast, right? And, and there again, you may actually have uh, certain families that could get stigmatized very quickly. 
This specific testing was very efficient when finding those who were really vulnerable to coronavirus infection. So one example, when the pandemic was at its height, was using this area-specific focus, he could pinpoint a dense area of code infection down to a single homeless shelter. Oh, that is incredible. So this is a new way of investigating on a viral level. And when Dominic is conducting those tests, is he just looking for COVID or is he casting the net wider? We're looking at, at SARS-CoV-2 now. Not only do we, do we quantify the amount of, of genome that we have, but we can also sequence the, the genomes that, that are present, right? So we can determine the variance that, that it is in the wastewater and, and find a number of, of uh, well, the different variants that could be in the population. And, and sometimes we... Um, we, we start seeing uh, interesting findings that we would not necessarily uh, suspect without the wastewater. So there's more, and it's kind of crazy. Dominic talked about a study from New York that showed multiple mutations of the virus in the wastewater that strangely weren't showing up in the human infection. I read about and this. And their clinical samples, yeah. It's it crazy. was awesome. COVID was spreading outside of the human population and mutating. And after uh, uh, looking at, at how the, the, the variants, some, some people evolve variants in different uh, animals to see how, you know, what kind of mutations would occur. And they, they noticed that the mutations they were seeing in the wastewater corresponded more to, to uh, mutations for a subpopulation of, of the virus, it corresponded to mutations that appeared when the, the virus was involved in rats, for example, in the lab. So how much does Dominic have to convince people that this wastewater monitoring approach to epidemiology is valid? Or are people like, yeah, let's let's look and let's learn from our wastewater? Well, Dominic says it's not that much accepted at all in Quebec. In fact, he says two years ago, no one was really talking about getting viral information from wastewater. The, the pandemic will have broken these, these silos in, in many ways. The, the public health practitioners, probably like a lot of, of professions, they're fairly conservative. And new data that they don't know about, you know, they, they, they want the data to be, to be proven. And, and uh, so what is interesting at this point is some authorities are, are slow at reacting, but the amount of research that was done in the last two years is what would typically happen maybe over 10 to 20 years, right? And, and the amount, the number of demonstrations from around the world at this point is probably uh, exactly, you know, over, over 10, 20 years. I really hope that uh, it won't just die off when, um, when COVID would be less of a problem as the system already exists because we built all this surveillance for COVID. Oh, here we have a new voice. Who's this? This is Dr. Kata Farkas. I'm an environmental virologist and my main research focus is waterborne viruses. In the theme of water, we go back to the pond to Bangor University in Wales. And Kata's project aims to describe the fate and behavior of wastewater-derived enteric viruses and use that to improve our current risk assessments in water. So those viruses that are very resistant in the environment, uh, they can stay infectious for very long and they can cause illness uh, if you bathe in the water or drink in the water and so on. And these are usually like diarrhea diseases, vomiting and all that. And actually how these viruses got into the environment, uh, they actually do that via wastewater. These viruses are transmitted via the fecal or oral route and they're found in feces of an infected person. Really high concentrations. I've heard of this. Is that what's called a norovirus? Yeah, that is one of them, exactly. If you are infected with norovirus, just one gram of your stool have enough viruses to infect each and every human being on the planet. Huge virus numbers we are talking about. They, they go down the toilet, down the sewers, down to the wastewater treatment plant. 
And even during the different treatment processes, they are really resistant. And unfortunately, they can be then um, discharged into the water environment. And then if you use that contaminated water, you might get sick. And even they accumulate in shellfish like oysters that if you eat them raw and they are coming from an area that's contaminated, you get sick. Or if you use that wastewater for irrigation, you might get sick too. So this was my main focus. And as you can understand, a huge aspect of it is seeing what's in the wastewater and whether these viruses are in the wastewater. I can imagine a lot of people might normally think of this as a problem in lower and middle income countries in what we call the global south. Or maybe they associate all of this with going on holiday, traveling in the tropics. You know, whenever you go to India, you've got to have that special vaccination card. But I get the sense that this is actually a real problem everywhere. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And it's a problem driven by urbanization rather than poverty or anything like that. The more people gather, the more wastewater we produce, the more of that is going into the environments. It's a problem in the UK, in mm -hmm. the European Union, um, in the US. So everywhere, it's not like a developing world problem per se. It's, it's really common. It's just more developed countries have more tools, more research and um, just more uh, mitigation efforts into it to, um, to deal with this situation. OK, OK, let's step back for just a second. Where did all of this start? Was it Jon Snow, the birth of epidemiology around that water pump in Soho during the cholera epidemic? When did we actually start this discipline of looking at what's in the water? Yeah, not quite far back um, as that, but, but a good while. Scientifically speaking, the surveillance of water bodies and wastewater have been going on for decades. The first studies that were like comprehensive and really looked into this problem, I think, were the 50s and 60s. So ever since then, we know that there is this issue and there's something us scientists can do about it. For instance, wastewater-based epidemiology, which is now we use for COVID-19, not just in the UK, but all around the world. We've been using that for poliovirus surveillance for, for decades again. So it's not like a completely new tool. We just now have better, uh, better systems and better processes and better ways to detect viruses and so on. But the concept is, is not new. Also, it can be used for certain chemicals or, or other pathogens too. So as a researcher, what does a typical day look like for Katha? Is she spending her time at sewage outfalls, woo, stinky, or in yeah. processing plants, in a lab coat? Do people send her samples? How does she actually process everything? And when she puts wastewater into a monitoring system, I mean, what does it just take us to her workplace? What does that look like? Yeah. Well, she says that the first thing to know is that her work is made a lot easier by the fact that the water industry, you know, the water supply companies are on board with her research and that helps all along the way. So they are completely happy with doing something for um, these projects if necessary or get deployed uh, auto samplers, which are uh, just devices able to take grab samples over the day so we would have a good idea on what's going on during the day and during the night and that helps a lot. So this is what's happening at the treatment plants and then we get these samples in um, and we process them. And a sample process can be really long and difficult because there, as you can imagine, there are so many things in wastewater. It's not just viruses, it's it's like everything that's coming from a household really via the sewers. So we have to make have to be very careful how we actually extract the viruses out from this material while we leave everything behind that would interfere with later detection. Kata says that during her work, she has to be really careful in how she actually extracts the viruses from the samples. I was wondering about that. That's why I was asking about her lab or if she is at sewage plants. I mean, we at Cytiva are really into 
separation into chromatography. We support protein separation, viral clearance. We do all of that kind of stuff. So what is the actual process of separating out the viruses and what kind of technologies does Dr. Farkas use? There are many things that we can do uh, right now, at least in the UK, there are two approaches that are used. Uh, we can either add chemicals and then we can uh, use a centrifuge to spin them down and have a virus pellet at the end. The other route that you can use is ultrafiltration. Um, so this is basically you have a membrane that has really, really small pores, smaller than the virus. And then you use some pressure to just push everything through those pores, except the virus. And if and, and anything that is bigger than the virus, I would just stay on top of the membrane. So you just get rid of actually the water part of the sample and then the proteins such as viruses, because viruses are basically big proteins, um, would, would stay on top and then you would have your concentrate. So how long until we have something domestically attached to the wastewater outlet from a home, which might signal that there is something in your house or your diet or your poop? I actually was watching a TV show where the talking toilet was telling the the, the character on the TV show, yeah. it's time to go see the doctor. Exactly. Well, yes. In fact, people are working on that. There's a couple of crowdfunded startups and so on. Um, but Carter says, look, sorry, <laughs> don't hold your breath or maybe do. Or maybe do. The issue there is that uh, you can do wastewater surveillance at a community level uh, without any restrictions at the moment because there are no ethics around it because it is at community level. You can't stigmatize people or communities. It's coming from everyone. But as soon as you are able to thank certain people, the ethics concerns would be huge. This is cool. And like now I'm now I'm inspired and in thinking about other ways that we could use this information and this data. OK, like, well, coming back to Barcelona, like finding out where are the cocaine capitals of the world or seriously, I mean, Bill Gates, you, you probably read this, Connor. He's yeah. been stressing the need to prevent the next pandemic when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. He has set up the Global Epidemic Response and Mobilization, so another acronym for us, GERM. Um, so wastewater monitoring could really play a role in something like that. Well, yes. In fact, Professor Freon says that you could monitor that by dividing up the city that's being inspected into different neighborhoods, and it could be more specific with the monitoring of viruses. So yesterday, for example, I, I was in discussion with somebody interested in providing recommendations as to what antimicrobials should be prescribed by, by physicians, say for urinary tract infections. They monitor what the, 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 the infections that they see in the hospital, and with that, you know, they, they, they provide recommendations. Well, most of the, the urinary tract infections are acquired in the community. And they're mainly auto inoculations, and and there's only a few types of of resistance that we should be monitoring for. So we could actually use the wastewater, and once again, with the wastewater, we could be ahead of the curve of of the infections that come to the clinic and and the kind of resistance that they're seeing in the clinic. So we could actually be more efficient at the type of antibiotics to to prescribe. They're based on the monitoring of the wastewater. So it's kind of fun, right? We think that this stuff is just flushed away and forgot. Yeah, and we, we forget about it as soon as we flush. How much information and data and insight that can be generated literally from the stuff that we throw away. I just think. love it. Yeah, what could we find in our normal trash, right? Or our recycling and what have you. Our executive producer is Andrea Killen, and this podcast is produced with the help of Bethany Grace Arvid Brewster. Editing, mixing, and music is by Thomas Henley and Banda Productions. My name is Connor McKechnie. And my name is Dodie Axelson. Please make sure you rate us on Spotify, where we are asking you to answer a very short poll under the episode description. If you're not on Spotify, you can find us on myriad other podcast platforms. And please do rate us there as well. We'll see you soon when we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters. Thank you for listening.